Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your church, for your body where we gather together with brothers and sisters who love you. I thank you for the opportunity to come before you boldly, confident that you've forgiven our sins through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, and the opportunity to worship you and to seek your will and your guidance for our lives. I pray that your word would go forth today and that through the power of your spirit, you would illuminate it in our hearts individually and help us understand what you would have us do and how you would have us live our lives. We love you and we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, today I'm going to be preaching from the book of Habakkuk. If you would like to follow along, you're welcome. I'll be putting the relevant verses on the screen. Um, Habakkuk's a short book. It's only three chapters long. You could read the whole thing from start to finish in five minutes. Why then? No. <laughs> um, I'm going to begin with a little story. In uh, 1972, Bob Davis became the pastor of a 46-member church, a Presbyterian church in Florida, and he helped it grow over time into the largest Protestant church in the city of Miami. Sixteen years later, though, he began to feel tired, and not just the normal kind of tired that we get with aging. He started forgetting the names of the people in the congregation. He went to the doctor, and the doctor found that one of his arteries was 95% locked, and they immediately scheduled him for surgery. And the surgery didn't fix the problem. Things began to get worse. He traveled he went to many different doctors, had many different tests and surgeries, and he continued to deteriorate, and the doctors could find nothing wrong with him. Finally, he decided that he could no longer perform his duties as pastor and decided to resign. There's an article in Christianity Today, and it relates to the conversation that he had with his wife, Betty. He says, why am I kidding myself, Betty? I can't function in ministry anymore. I can't read the Bible. I forget appointments. I can't remember what people said to me. All my life I had a plan B in case something happened. And now all my alternate plans are gone. Why? Why would God do that? His suffering was getting progressively worse. He didn't know what was happening to him. He didn't know when or if it was going to end. How long was this going to last is what he thought. How long is a common theme of scripture? How long, O oh Lord, must we suffer? There are 17 distinct instances in scripture where someone speaks to God and says, some version of how long, O oh Lord, is this going to go on? How long will I have to endure that? In Psalm 90, Moses complains to God and says, how long must this suffering last? Several of these are King David in the Psalms. In Psalm 6, he asks, how long will this continue? In Psalm 13, how long, Lord, will you continue to ignore me? How long will you pay no attention to me? How long must I worry? How long will my enemy gloat over me? In Psalm 35, oh Lord, how long are you going to just stand there and watch this? Asaph, who wrote some of those psalms, complained to God. In Psalm 74, how long, O oh God, will the adversary hurl insults? And in Psalm 79, how long will this go on, O oh Lord? How long will your rage burn like fire? The prophet Jeremiah says, how long must I see the enemy's flags? How long must the land be parched? How long must the animals and the birds die. And there are several others. Judah and Israel were often suffering under foreign adversaries, and often because of their own sins. They often had cause to cry out to God, how long? From the time of King David, Israel enjoyed a brief golden age. And it's maybe unfair to call it a golden age because they're constantly at war with their neighbors but they were largely free from the oppression of their neighbors. They were an independent kingdom. But in 722 BC, Assyria invaded the northern kingdom of Israel, conquered it completely, and sent the people into exile. From that time on, Judah, the southern kingdom, was under the thumb of one world power or another. It was a vassal kingdom with only brief interludes of independence. For the next 100 years after that, God's people endured the domination of nations that hated God. They suffered for many of those years under King Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, about whom scripture says, he killed so many innocent people, he stained Jerusalem with their blood from end to end. 
Manasseh, the worst king in Judah's history, reigned for 55 years, almost as long as Queen Elizabeth. I think he was longer than any other king of Judah. So why would God allow the reign of such an evil king to go on for so long? Judah became the battleground for the heathen nations and the victim of its own evil kings. They experienced revival and a righteous king under Josiah for three decades, beginning by about 609 BC, the entire world was falling apart. Assyria was the world's major power at the time, and they utterly destroyed Israel, the northern kingdom, and brutally oppressed Judah. In 626, though, when King Josiah was king, the Babylonians rebelled against the Assyrians and pushed them out of their own territory. By 616, just 10 years later, the Babylonians had invaded the Assyrian Empire and were beginning to close in on them. The mighty empire was weakening and their former vassals were moving against them. In 612, Babylon and their allies, the Medes and the Scythians, destroyed Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria, just as the prophet Nahum had predicted. The Assyrians retreated, they built a new capital of Haram, but Babylon is continuing to grow while Assyria shrinks. Pharaoh Necho, the king of Egypt, sent his army to come to the aid of Assyria, and King Josiah, perhaps seeing an opportunity as Assyria, their long-time oppressors weakening, sent his army out with himself at their head to meet Pharaoh Necho, and he met the armies of the Egyptians in a plain, a valley in the northern part of the kingdom called Har Megiddo. And in Greek, you might recognize the word Armageddon. That's the place where we met King Josiah. And in that battle, King Josiah was killed. So the one good king, the best king that Israel's ever had, he's dead now in 609 BC. So how long have the Israelites suffered under the heels of foreign enemies? How long have they endured the torture and murder of their own God-rejecting kings? How long have they lived without justice and it's, this is the context. This is right around the time when Habakkuk begins to speak. And we don't know the exact date, but it was right in this time when Israel or Judah is constantly under the influence and the sway of all these different people. Enemies from without, enemies from within, and it looks like God is doing nothing. <clears throat> almost all the other prophets, if you read through them in the Old Testament, they almost always begin with God speaking to the prophet, giving them a message. Sometimes out of the blue. Isaiah says, here's the message about Judah and Jerusalem that was revealed to Isaiah. So God gave him a message to give to the people. Jeremiah said, the Lord said to me, Ezekiel says, I saw a divine vision. Hosea says, this is the word of the Lord that was revealed. Joel said, this is the Lord's message that was given. If you go through the minor prophets, they're all, God said this to me, told me to tell this to the people of Israel, or to the people of Judah, or to the people of the surrounding nations. But Habakkuk is different. It's not a message from God to the people of Israel, or from God to the prophet himself, or from God to the enemies. It begins with Habakkuk speaking to God. He actually begins complaining to God. The book begins, O oh Lord, how long? Just like that. How long? How long shall I cry for help and you will not hear, or cry to you violence, and you will not save? So he begins by complaining to God, asking him how long. Habakkuk, as I said, it's three chapters. It's very short. The first two chapters are the record of Habakkuk complaining to God and God answering Habakkuk. The third chapter is a hymn. It's a hymn of praise and encouragement to God's people. And honestly, sometimes we read the Psalms and we use them to kind of lift us up or we, in our own private time we'll read the Psalms to help us pray and orient ourselves to God. The third chapter of Habakkuk can be used in exactly the same way. It's a hymn just like any of the other 150 hymns of the book of hymns, a book of Psalms. In the opening verse of the book of Habakkuk, the book is described as a prophecy. If you read in the, uh, the NIV version of the Bible, on the next slide, it says, the prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received if you read the New English Triple, no, if you, I mistyped that, that's my fault. If you read the New English translation, it says the message which Habakkuk the prophet did see. And if you look at the King James, it says the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. So in one version it says prophecy, in one version it says message, 
And in another version it says burden. Now it is a prophecy, but the word, the Hebrew word that they use there, it almost every, it appears, I think Strong says 66 times in the Old Testament. And 62 of those times it's talking about a burden. And it's translated with the word burden. So Isaiah is getting, or Habakkuk is getting a message, a prophecy from God, but he describes it as a burden, a trial. It's something that he saw that caused him distress. He was looking around him at all the evil in the world and all the things were happening, and he's not seeing God do anything about it, and it's causing him to suffer. He pleads with God to tell him how long it would continue. In verse 1 it says, The following is the message which God reveals to Habakkuk the prophet. I'm using the New English translation, but you can follow along whichever version you like. How long, Lord, must I cry for help, but you do not listen? I call out to you violence, but you do not intervene. In verse 3, Why do you force me to witness injustice? Why do you put up with wrongdoing? Destruction and violence confront me. Conflict is present, and one must endure strife. For this reason the law lacks power and justice is never carried out. Indeed, the wicked intimidate the innocent. For this reason, justice is perverted. Habakkuk doesn't specify the source of what's causing him such distress. He doesn't say it's the Assyrians or the Babylonians or, or King Manasseh or, or anything else, but we can gather from history that it, it's one of those things or all of those things collectively that he's struggling with. But he does say six things in particular. He says he's complaining about violence. He complains about injustice, about wrongdoing, destruction, conflict, and strife. And of course, we know those are things that only happen in Bible times, right? <coughs> those are the things that we complain about today. How many of you can think of a time recently when you've either complained about or noticed strife and conflict at work or at school? We complain about injustice and wrongdoing by the government, the police, companies, and even individuals. And it only takes a cursory glance at the news to find violence and destruction to complain about in the world and even in our own country. Habakkuk looks at these things and he says to God, he says, you do not listen, you do not intervene, you put up with wrongdoing. Is that true? Does God not listen? No, we know that those things are not true. Habakkuk probably knows that those things are not true, but he's suffering. He's complaining to God. God, instead of scolding him for his complaints, God answers his complaint clearly. God actually tells him exactly what he's going to do so that Habakkuk doesn't have to worry. In verse 5 it says, Look at the nations and pay attention. You will be shocked and amazed, for I will do something in your lifetime that you will not believe, even though you're forewarned. Look, I'm about to power the Babylonians, that ruthless and greedy nation, they sweep across the surface of the earth, seizing dwelling places that don't belong to them. They're frightening and terrifying. They decide for themselves what's right. Their horses are faster than leopards. Let me pause right there. Are any horses faster than leopards? Literally? No, they're not. So is God lying here? Or is God mistaken? Is it a problem with the Bible? No. This is what we call a apocalyptic language. We see this all throughout the prophets. We see it in the book of Revelation, several other places in scripture. God is using apocalyptic language. He doesn't literally mean that they're faster than leopards. He's community. It's the same as when we use hyperbole. I've been waiting in line forever. Well, do you really mean forever? Do you really expect that other people will think you've been waiting in life since the beginning of time? No, of course not. That's just how humans use language. God reveals scripture to us, not in mathematics, not in scientific formula. He uses human language, and he uses the same conventions that we use in human language. So he uses hyperbole and apocalyptic language, and we'll see that throughout scripture. So you can see that in many places in Habakkuk, God uses the same kind of apocalyptic language. He says, they're more alert than wolves in the desert. Their horses gallop, their horses come a great distance. Like a vulture, they swoop down quickly to devour their prey. In verse 9, all of them intend to do violence. Every face is determined. They take prisoners as easily as one scoops up sand. They mock kings and laugh at rulers. They laugh at every fortified city. They build siege rings and capture them. They sweep by like the wind and pass on. God says he's going to take the Babylonians and empower them, enable them to sweep across the world and wipe out the Assyrians, the power that's oppressing Judah. The Assyrians were evil. 
But the Babylonians weren't necessarily bad. God calls them ruthless and greedy. All of them attempt to do violence, but God's going to use them as his tool to sweep away the Assyrians. Now, we know God never does evil. Not because God chooses to, or God's really good at self-control, like I mean, God sometimes wants to do evil, but he just manages to kind of keep a lid on it. It's part of God's nature. God can't do evil. He can't want to do evil. It's just not part of it. So he never does evil, but God is the master of taking things that are evil and turning them to good and using them. Uh, I know some of you are in a Bible study where you're using a, a book that's called God's Devil. It's based on a quote from Martin Luther where he said, even the devil is God's devil. So God didn't make the devil behave evilly, but God is able, more than able, to take his evil and use it for good. So the Babylonians were about to become God's Babylonians. They'd sweep through and destroy the remnants of the Assyrians and forever remove their scourge from Judah. God says that he's already got it taken care of. It hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen soon. And in fact, it was just four years later, after the death of King Josiah in 609, four years later, that the last remnants of the Assyrian army, together with the Egyptians, went out to meet the Babylonians at Carchemish, which is north of Israel. It's in today what's kind of northwest Syria. The Assyrians were just retreating further and further back, and now they only had one little enclave left, and that's where they made their last stand against the Babylonians, and the Babylonians crushed them. Assyria never again was a world power. There was no place ever again called Assyria. And the, the Egyptians were so weakened by this that they never again exerted influence in the uh, Mideast. They never recovered. So Habakkuk has a complaint. What are you doing? Why are you doing nothing? God says, I've got it covered, the problem solved, and the story happened. Right? Have you ever had a problem that you need God's help with? Eh, not just a little one, like I can't find my car keys. Those are things we need God's help with too. Sometimes I get more frustrated by those little things than I need by big things. Um, you know, I, I, I deal with tragedy sometimes much more easily than I deal with annoyances, as my wife would probably tell you. But if you had something that caused you anguish that went on for so long, you could feel the pain in your bones. When you don't have any idea what to do to solve the problem, you wake up in the morning, and you, when you remember it, it feels like a weight settling down on you. Something that keeps you from thinking straight, keeps you from doing work, from planning for the future, or even imagining there, that there might be a future. A crisis where you look forward to sleeping at night because it's the one time you don't have to think about it. Something where you've cried out to God in your heart or even out loud, how long, when will this end? I wager that many of you here have. Some of you might be going through something like that right now. So how do you get up? How do you put one foot in front of another and go about your day? How do you comfort yourself? And you might have a friend or an acquaintance or a family member who's going through something like that. How do you comfort them? What do you tell them? Do you ever wish that like Habakkuk, God would just speak to you and tell you, okay, it's going to be bad, but it's going to be over in exactly 18 months and four days, and these are the negative repercussions, and here's how I'm going to solve the problem. I, I long for that to happen. It's sometimes it's not the trial itself, it's the not knowing that causes the most distress. Well, that's what God did for Habakkuk. He told him exactly how he was going to resolve this problem. So God, Habakkuk takes some comfort from this. He knows that these Syrians are going away and they're never coming back. In verse 12 and 13, he says, Lord, you've been active from ancient times. My sovereign Lord, you are immortal. Lord, you've made them the instrument of your judgment, them, the Babylonians. Protector, you have appointed them as your instrument of punishment. This brings us to the second part of Habakkuk, the second complaint or question for God, and it begins at the end of chapter 1. It might have been better to make that chapter 2 there, but someone else did the number, not me. Um, Habakkuk's comforted that the Assyrians are gone away, but at the same time, when he hears what the solution means, he's probably a little bit horrified. Let me give you an analogy to explain why. In the early... Any of you ever live in the southeast or grew up in the southeast, Georgia, Mississippi, those kind of places? Some of you, okay, so some, some of the pictures I show you will be familiar to you. In the early 1900s, the U.S. was having a problem with soil erosion. A lot of the soil was getting washed away. So the Soil Erosion Service, service recommended a fast-growing plant from Japan called Japanese arrowroot, 
or the Japanese word was kutsu, which became anglicized in English to kutsu. They said this would be a great plant because it will, the roots will hold every, all the soil in place and they'll cover things and it won't take a lot of work to grow really fast. So they imported kutsu and they, they gave out for free 85 million seedlings and they paid farmers about $20 for every two and a half acres. So about $8 an acre to their planted kudzu. And it was a huge success. The soil erosion problem was completely eliminated rapidly. The plant grew at about, every plant, at about a foot a day, or 120,000 acres per year. In about 100 years, it spread to cover seven and a half million acres of the southeast United States. It became known as the plant that ate the south. Kudzu now destroys every year 100 to 500 million dollars worth of forest productivity because it grows over trees, blocks out the sunlight, and kills them. The same government that spent $8 an acre to plant kudzu now spends $2,000 an acre to remove Power companies spend $1.5 million a year fixing damage to power lines caused by cuts. It's one of many examples of a cure being worse than the original disease. So Habakkuk listened to the Lord's description of the Babylonians, and he wondered if they were going from the frying pan to the fire. The Babylonians were the cuts of the ancient Near East. He says, as we read it just a minute ago, they sweep across the surface of the earth, seizing dwelling places that don't belong to them. They're frightening and terrifying. They decide for themselves what's right. Their horses faster than leopards. So the Babylonians, like Kutsu, are eating up the entire Middle East. So back in, he just complained to God, which is a very bold and brave thing to do. And God, instead of being angry, instead of chastising him, he answers him. So it worked once. So Habakkuk decides to try again. He says, <laughs> something along the lines of, uh, I, I know you're smart, I know you're wise, but have you considered it? He says, you're too just to tolerate evil. You're unable to condone wrongdoing, so why do you put up with treacherous people? Why do you say nothing when the wicked devour those more righteous than they are? You make people like fish in the sea, like animals in the sea that have no ruler. The Babylonian tyrant pulls them up with a fisher. He uses this analogy, he complains, compares the Babylonians to a fisherman. He says he calls them in with the throw net, and the fish are the nations. When he catches them in his dragnet, he's very happy. Because of success, he offers sacrifices to his throw net. He burns incense to his dragnet, for because of them, he has plenty of food, more than enough to eat. Will he then continue to fill and empty his throw net? Will he always destroy nations and spare them? So he complained, what are you going to do about the Assyrians and Egyptians? Well, I'm going to bring the Babylonians. What are you going to do about the Babylonians then? He asks, when you raise Babylon up to deal with Assyria, what are you going to do about Babylon? He's basically asking the question, are you make, making us swallow a spider to eat the fly? You guys know the children's song, the old lady who swallowed a fly? And you guys know it's swallowed a cow to catch the goat, swallowed the goat to catch the dog, swallowed a dog to catch the cat, swallowed the cat to catch the bird, swallowed the bird to catch the spider, that wriggled and jiggled and wiggled inside her. She swallowed spider to catch fly, I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she'll die. And then the very last verse of the song, I know a lady who swallowed a horse. She's dead, of course. Habakkuk is wondering if Babylon is the horse, and God is going to make them swallow it. And if you know anything about the history, you can sympathize with them. You know what Babylon did to Judah. They burned the temple, they tore down the walls of Jerusalem. They killed the people and exiled the rest. They ruined Jerusalem. So Habakkuk's not out of, he's, he's not out in left field when he's giving this complaint to God. His concerns are well-founded, but Habakkuk trusts God at the same time. He doesn't know what the solution is, but even while he's complaining, he knows God's going to do something. So he says, in the very beginning of chapter 2, he says, I will stand at my watch post. I will remain stationed on the city wall. And again, I don't think he's literally talking about standing on the city wall. He's talking about watching to see what God's going to do. He says, I will keep watch so I can see what he says to me and can know how I should answer when he counters my argument. I love that. He says, when he counters my argument. He says, basically, God, 
you're doing something that's not fair. Because that's what he sees. But he knows he's wrong, and he knows God's right, and he doesn't know how, but he knows God has an answer. So he says, when you answer my argument. In verse 2, it says, the Lord responded, write down this message, record it legibly on tablets. You know, when you think about how they wrote back then, a lot of times it was clay tablets that they inscribed. So the one who announces it may read it easily, for the message is a witness to what is decreed. It gives reliable testimony about how matters will turn out, even if the message is not fulfilled right away. Wait patiently, for it will certainly come to pass. It will not arrive late. So God tells Habakkuk, I have an answer to this too. It's not going to happen right away, but it will be soon, and you need to trust the message. Even if the message is not fulfilled right away, wait patiently. And this is the message that he gave him. He says, look, the one whose desires are not upright will faint from exhaustion, but the person of integrity will live by his faithfulness. Indeed, wine will betray the proud, restless man, his appetite as big as Sheol. Does anyone know what Sheol refers to? It has a couple of meanings. A lot of times it's translated as hell. That's where we get our modern word hell from. But in Hebrew it means the grave. And by, sin, by extension it means death. And he says his appetite is as big as death. How much does death consume? Do you give it time? Everything. Like death, he's never satisfied. He gathers all the nations. He seizes all the peoples. So who is he talking about? He's talking about Babylon. Because you've robbed many countries, all who are left among the nations will rob you. You've shed human blood and committed violent acts against the lands, cities, and those who live in them. The one who builds his house by unjust gain is as, it, is as good as dead. He does this so he can build his nest way up high and escape the clutches of disaster. Your schemes will bring shame to your house. Because you destroyed many nations, you will self-destruct. So God promises that in his time, he'll deal with Babylon too, for its murders, its violence, its greed and its idolatry. So what do we have so far? Habakkuk complains about Assyria. God says he has a plan. He's going to bring the Babylonians. Habakkuk says, well, what about the Babylonians then? Aren't they worse? God says he's going to take care of them too. Wait and be patient. So how does this relate to our suffering? Remember I asked, wouldn't it be nice if God told us exactly how he was going to deal with any of our difficulties or problems? How does that help us when we're crying out to God, how long will this go on? So he at least had the partial comfort of knowing Assyria was going to go away and that Babylon eventually would be cast down too. But if you're suffering, if you've been diagnosed with cancer, has God promised us, any individual, that God is going to heal you? No. God has the power, and God sometimes does. But he doesn't promise, give any one of us promise that he's going to do that. When you don't know where the mortgage payment is going to come from, has God promised that he's going to provide money for that? No, he hasn't. When your spouse decides that he or she just isn't that into you anymore, there's no promise that God's going to drag them back. When your children go astray, or are sick, or are hurt, or your country's going down the wrong path, God has not promise that he's going to fix any one of those things in the short term. When you have an undiagnosed condition, like Pastor Bob Jones, that causes you to forget and lose your faculties, or when you've been married for six months, for, for a year, and your doctors tell you you have six months to live and you're only 29 years old. God hasn't made promises to any of us to cure those ills right now in the short term. But he has made promises, big promises, extravagant ones. I want you to think about some trial or difficulty that you're going through. No matter how big or small, it doesn't have to be something terrible. Or maybe something that someone you love is going through. Ask yourself, has God explicitly promised in Scripture that He's going to fix my problem in my lifetime? If your problem is that you feel like you're alone in the world, and no one truly knows who you are, God's promised you explicitly that He can fix that one, and He will fix that one. He will be there with you. If your problem is that you feel like no one loves you, God will help you with that too. He promises to never leave us or forsake us. If your problem is sin, you feel guilty, you know that you've done things you shouldn't do. God promises that he'll deal with that one too. He promises that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He says that if we believe in Christ his Son, that he'll wash away our sins and we'll be with him forever. He promised that he can't break his promise. It's against his nature. It's just not a thing he can do. 
But if you promise something else, there likely isn't a promise in Scripture that says God is definitely going to fix that in a lifetime. So we as Christians can't stand up to the shaky ground of promises that God didn't make. So when will the sickness end? I don't know. Maybe never. Maybe I'll die from it. Maybe I'll linger on in pain and sickness for the rest of my life. There's no promise to guarantee that that's going to be fixed, but there is a problem that covers all... Promise, not problem. There's a promise that covers all of those situations. Actually, there are two promises that God's made that covers those situations. The first one is the smallest promise, even though it's an amazing promise. It's the smallest, and it's the easiest one. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul writes, For we know that if our earthly house, the tent we live in, is dismantled, we have a building from God. And of course, he's not talking about your home or in camper or anything like that. He's talking about your body. When he says the earthly tent that we live in is dismantled, he's talking about dying. He says if we die, we have a building from God. God has promised us a new body and a new life in the resurrection. A house not built by human hands that is eternal in the heavens. For in this earthly house, our body, we groan because we desire to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed, after we've put on our heavenly house, we will not be found naked. For we groan while we're in this tent, since we are weighed down, because we do not want to be unclothed, but clothed. So that is what, so that that, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. So in this life, we're weighed down by our bodies, by our physical ailments, and by our emotional struggles. But God promises us that that's when we will go away. Now the one who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a down payment. Therefore, we were always full of courage. For we know that as long as we're alive here on earth, we're absent from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. Isn't that what Habakkuk said? That we'll live by faithfulness. Thus we're full of courage and we prefer to be away from the body and not home with the Lord. So that whether we are alive or away, we make it our ambition to please Him. So whatever suffering I endure, I know, no matter how long it goes on, there's an end point. It'll end with the end of my life. When you're in the throes of physical suffering or emotional <laughs> anguish, every minute sometimes seems to crawl by. But crawl by they do, and there will be an end to the suffering. So when my time comes, I'll be absent from this earthly house, the body that weighs me down, and I'll immediately be in the presence of God. So until that time, I try to do what Paul says and make it my ambition to please him. There's a rising tide of opinion in this country that says that if we can't make the suffering go away, we're better off making the life to stop. <coughs> Brittany Maynard, remember I said diagnosed with cancer? She was 29 years old when she was diagnosed with brain cancer, inoperable brain cancer, and they gave her six months to live. She wrote that, quote, I probably would have suffered in hospice care for weeks or even months, and my family would have had to watch that. I did not want this nightmare scenario for my family, so I started researching death with dignity. I quickly decided that death with dignity was the best option for me and my family. She lived quite a bit longer than the six months that her doctors told her were her maximum. But in the end, she did decide to commit suicide. She moved to Oregon and got a prescription from her doctor and took her own life. Euthanasia and assisted suicide, they're another topic for another day. But I will say that we as Christians, we need to do two things. We need to work tirelessly to alleviate mental and physical suffering wherever we can. That's part of what God has called us to do, is to help people when they're suffering. But we also need to stalwartly and unashamedly demand that the culture respect the intrinsic value of human life. Human life has value even if the person's tiny fingers are still developing in the womb or whether the person is on their, in their last days of life, whether that person has the same IQ as us, the same mental faculties as us, us the same physical abilities as us, or no physical abilities at all. All human life has intrinsic value and deserves our protection from conception to natural death. So we need to pour our wealth, time, and energy into reducing suffering and not eliminating the sufferers.
But we know that as Christians, when our earthly life ends, all our earthly sufferings will end too, but that shouldn't make us want to hasten the end of our lives. Instead, it gives us the courage and purpose to endure whatever hardships may come for however long they may last. In our anguish, we may cry out, how long? But the answer is always, never too long. It may be long, but it will never be too long. So our first thing that we can hold on to is no matter how difficult our suffering's in, there's a definite end point. We don't know when it is, but it's going to happen. But the second promise is bigger. It's greater than that one. The last how long in Scripture is in Revelation chapter 6. John is seeing a vision and he says, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been violently killed because of the word of God and because of the testimony they'd given they cried out with a loud voice, How long, Sovereign Master, holy and true, before you judge those who live on the earth and avenge our blood? Each of them was given a long white robe, and they were told to rest a little longer. So they cried out, and they asked God, How long until the end of time, until the final judgment on the enemies of God? How long until you make everything new again? They were told to wait a little longer, and in the last chapters of the book of Revelation, John sees the fulfillment of that promise. He sees a new heaven and a new earth with no mourning, crying, or pain in the presence of God forever and ever. That's the ultimate answer to the question of how long. But we don't know when that will happen, but we know that it will happen. And we know that that answer to suffering is not like a Babylonian end, where it's a solution that needs a solution that needs a solution. It'll be once and for all time and for all people. <laughs> so, we have that comfort to hold on to, but until then, what do we do? At the beginning of chapter 3, Habakkuk gives us two things that we can do. He remembers the deeds of old, the past deliverance that God provided for his people. At the beginning of chapter two, verse, chapter 3, verse 2, he says, Lord, I've heard the report of what you did. I am awed, Lord, by what you accomplished. In our time, repeat those deeds. In our time, reveal them again. But when you cause turmoil, remember to show mercy. God comes from heaven, the sovereign one from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the skies. His glory fills the earth. Habakkuk is giving a vision. He's seeing things that God, he's seeing things that God did in the past. His sovereign and powerful deliverance of Israel and past. And when he describes it, he uses that apocalyptic language again. He said, he is as bright as lightning. A two-pronged lightning bolt flashes from his hand. This is the outward display of his power. Plague goes before him. Pestilence marches right behind him. He takes his battle position and shakes the earth. With a mere look, he frightens the nations. The ancient mountains disintegrate. The primeval hills are flattened. He travels on the ancient roads. I see the tents of Kushan overwhelmed by trouble. The tent curtains of the land of Midian are shaken. So Habakkuk remembers the awesome and terrible power of God that he used in the past to deliver Israel. He is remembering when God brought them through the Red Sea. He is remembering when God wiped out the armies in Moab, when God delivered them from Assyria. He's remembering all of these things to remind himself that he's the same God, that his power and his character are the same. He still is able to deliver, and he still has the same loving kindness. But he also looks forward to the coming deliverance. In verse 16, he says, I listened, and my stomach churned. He's experiencing these physical, emotional symptoms. The sound made my lips quiver. My frame went limp as if my bones were decaying, and I shook as I tried to walk. I long for the day of distress to come upon the people who attack us. So he's longing for the day when Babylon and Assyria are wiped out. Which may sound like a cruel thing, but there are cruel people who are looking for the day when these evil things are no longer tolerated. In your bulletin on the back, instead of an outline, put some questions there. The last question was, which verses from Habakkuk would be good for us to memorize or repeat to ourselves when we encounter burdens, unresolved physical or emotional struggles? Memorizing scripture, even short scriptures, it's, it's, it's a good way 
to have God's word with you so that when you're struggling with temptation or struggling feeling alone or, or, or feeling hopeless in situations, you have something you can immediately call to mind to remind you of the truth of God's word. And um, a lot of people memorize the last verse of the back. It's 319. It's a very famous verse. It says, The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. There's even a book, Hind Speed on Hind Places, that, that uses that, that verse as the, the idea. It, it, it's a verse about God giving us power and enabling us to do everything. But me, in the darkest, most difficult times of my life, I always find myself coming back to verses 17 and 18. These are the ones that I memorized. It says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, Though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. In those verses, there are no hopeful signs. Nothing good is happening. Nothing good on the horizon. Everything is bad. And even then, yet still, he's going to be close. In my life, when my heart pounded, my lips quivered, decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled, when I could imagine no end to my problems, I would remember those verses. Even though everything's terrible, still I will rejoice. Although all indicators are negative, and God hasn't promised any short-term solution, even so, I'll look forward to that ultimate promise. Pastor Bob Davis, the one I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, Eventually, after numerous tests, he was diagnosed with what seems obvious to us in retrospect. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. He decided to live. He resigned his pastorship. He was no longer able to do it. He decided to live, despite having no promise from God about what his last days would be like. Eventually, he lost the ability to speak before groups. He was still able to come to church, but he couldn't sing. He couldn't follow along. A lot of them didn't know what was happening. And but like anyone with Alzheimer's, sometimes we have good days and sometimes we have bad days. And they said on the good days he would still meet with individuals and pray with them and counsel them. He had value. He had worth. Even up to the last day of his life. Even after he lost the ability to do those last little things, even when he could do nothing at all, he still had value and worth. He didn't know what lay ahead of him beyond a reasonable assurance that it would involve pain and difficulty for himself and for his wife. But still he lived out that, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Jason Lobaxter said in the book of Habakkuk that it begins with a sob and ends with a song. Nothing we know of from Scripture tells us whether Habakkuk lived to see the deliverance from Babylon. He probably didn't because it was about 100 years later. That's okay. And it was okay with Habakkuk. He didn't need to see it. He knew that it would come because God had promised. So we too have a promise. One that transcends all the petty difficulties of this life. All the light and momentary troubles of time. That speaks to eternity. Our lives begin with a cry. There are many sobs in between. But like the book of Habakkuk, it will end for the Christian. Not with earthly sorrow, but in eternal sorrow. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your word. It humbles me to think that you managed to preserve, protect all those words down through the centuries, down through millennia, and deliver them to us. But nothing, nothing is beyond your power. It wasn't difficult for you, it was easy. And you did it because you loved us. So I want to thank you for your word. It's your letter to us. It's how you communicate to us. Lord, I just pray that when we seek you, that we would seek you in the pages of Scripture. That you would speak to us. That we'd seek your Holy Spirit to illuminate the words and apply them to our lives. Lord, when I read Habakkuk, I'm reminded that we don't have a lot of promises we don't have a lot of assurances that navigating through life, sometimes it's like a lightning flash at night that illuminates things and then we have to move on 
finding our way based on our memory. That Lord, what was illuminated in that lightning flash, the promises that you've given us for the new time, they're enough to guide us through any darkness, through any travels, over hills and ravines and in dark places, Lord. So I pray that you help us, your children, your followers, to cling to your word, to grow close to you through it. I pray this week that you'd watch over us, that you'd guide us, that you'd help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, that in the midst of our trials and troubles, that you would help us to keep our eyes fixed on that eternal promise. I pray that you'd help us to depend on each other and share those burdens with one another so that we can alleviate sufferings and care for each other. And I pray that you'd help us to go out into the world as well and to alleviate sufferings and to bring comfort to where we can. We love you and we pray in Jesus' precious name. Thank you all for coming. Bless you guys. Have a good evening.